and uh, so we're really appreciative of that. COSI Florida stands for the Centers for Ocean Sciences Education Excellence, and it's one of a network of COSI centers around the country and COSI sites uh, everywhere from Hawaii to Florida to Maine and Alaska. Uh, and so we're really uh, excited to have that, this partnership uh, here in, in Fort Pierce, based out of the Indian River State College. And the partners in COSI Florida are IRSC, Florida Tech up in Melbourne, ORCA, the Ocean Research and Conservation Association here in Fort Pierce, and the Smithsonian Marine Station at Fort Pierce. And we've really been working hard together as a team to try to advance COSI Florida and some of the things that we're trying to do. The overall network's mission is to uh, nurture the collaboration between research scientists and educators to advance ocean discovery and make known the vital role of the ocean in our lives. So it really is a network to try to advance education and outreach in the ocean sciences. And so we've got a couple of uh, main initiatives in Coastly Florida. The first is uh, ocean-based public programs and educator workshops. And so this is an example of one of the uh, public programs that we've been doing with Coastly Florida. and uh, just tell you a little bit about, uh, finish up without it, because I only have about two more slides. So let me try skipping over that one and seeing if this works. Anyway, um, and so we have these ocean-based public lectures as part of uh, COSI Florida, and also working on pre-service educator uh, train, uh, teaching at IRSC, and that's an exciting opportunity to, to work between scientists and uh, the pre-service teachers in the educational programs at IRSC. And also uh, working with Florida Tech, we have uh, different uh, workshops for professional development for the scientists themselves. And so this, uh, this whole partnership is, is designed to really advance ocean education, uh, both to the, through, through education, formal education, through teacher training, as well as uh, informal education. And so we're really delighted to be a part of all that. So I'm going to um, go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight, who's uh, Dr. Stephen Box. And uh, Steve, Steve's been working in uh, along the coastal uh, the coast of Honduras now for a, a little over 10 years. Uh, he's been working there to uh, conduct research that helps support local efforts to conserve and manage the coral reefs, marine life, and mangrove, and uh, uh, other coastal communities of the coast of Honduras. He's a native of England, and he received his PhD in biology from the University of Exeter in the uh, UK. And the reason he uh, came to the, or began his work in Honduras is he started working there as a PhD student. And that was uh, over 10 years ago, and, and for many years he never left. Last year, or earlier, uh, early last year, he joined the Smithsonian Marine Station as a staff member, but he's still continuing to conduct most of his research in Honduras. Um, he's He's, uh, he and his team down there are focusing on the role of fishing and structuring coastal ecosystems and the dependence of rural communities on these resources. And tonight he's going to talk to us about uh, his work down there. And the title of his talk is Solving Jigsaw Puzzles in the Sea, the Science Behind Placing Marine Protected Areas. <laughs> Thank you all very much for being here tonight. I know you all have lots of other things to do, and it's a real pleasure that you could come and spare, spare some time to learn about my work. And my job tonight is to take on a journey, to take us beyond Fort Pierce, in fact, out of Florida, out of the United States. And I actually want to take you to Central America. So this will find you work. Or not, I'll hit that button and let the journey begin. And the reason I want to take you away is I want to take you to a new, a new country, a country in Central America, and it's right here. We can fly into it. And it's a small country of Honduras. 
And just off the coast of Honduras, which is a tropical Central American country, we've got beautiful, shallow water, crystal clear water that supports wonderful coral reefs. And underwater, we have fantastic coral reef structures all across the coast of Honduras. And we also have wonderful mangrove forests and seagrass beds. Now, why are we interested in these areas? These are incredibly biodiverse ecosystems. And we, as biologists, are fascinated by the kind of diversity that these systems can support. But we're also interested in the fish life that's there. Here we have a wonderful Nassau grouper. Can anyone recognize this? This is actually a queen con. So we're interested not only in the fish, but in the invertebrates, in the, the megafauna, the animals that everyone wants to, to go and see, and National Geographic wants to go and photograph. We find those, again, in these same areas. And why is that important? It's important because of the goods and services, not only from the biological point of view, but from the human perspective. And here, we're supporting fisheries, so we've got rural communities that really depend for their food security and their incomes on these areas. We've got marine recreation. So in Honduras, this is obviously interacting with the water by jumping off piers, but in other parts of the Caribbean, that could include sailing, it could include boating, it could include literally just sitting on the beach. And we also have tourism. And tourism is a very, very important component of the Caribbean economy. And within Honduras, there's specific areas you may have heard of, such as Roatan or Utila, the Bay Islands, where the cruise ships go. People are going there to see these reef systems. So they're incredibly important economically, as well as biologically. Now, why Honduras? I keep mentioning this country, and I've spent a lot of time there. I only recently moved to the Smithsonian. I spent the last decade working there. And why? Now, it's a small country. It's, it's very, very small, in fact. And it's right in the middle of Central America. But it's also, if you look at that map, right in the middle of the Western Atlantic. And it forms the southern part of the Mesoamerican barrier reef system. And that's a really important reef system that stretches from Honduras north through Belize and up into Mexico. And that actually forms the second largest barrier reef system in the world after the one in Australia. And it's the largest barrier reef system in the Western Hemisphere. But not only that, if that wasn't enough, it's also the frontier between two different eco-regions. So we're the southern extent of the Mesoamerican reef, but we're also the northern extent of the Nicaraguan rise. And why is this important? It means that Honduras is the frontier between these two ecosystems. So we've got currents taking, larvae, and connecting these reef systems north, but from the eastern side, it's also connecting south, down into Central America. So it has a really pivotal role it's kind of the, the trading post, the crossover point between these two systems, these two areas. So that's the biological reason. It's a fascinating place to work. But from a social area, a social perspective, Honduras is also one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. In fact, it's second only to Haiti. And the average income there, the GDP, is about $2,000 a year. So it's very, very poor. And unfortunately, partly because of poverty, but partly because of technical, uh, or lack of technical capacity, they're not capable at the moment, as a country, to ensure that the goods and services of their natural resources, specifically their marine resources, can be sustainably used for the future to guarantee that the next generation can, can use them. Here we have one of the next generations. So, my work is to look at coral reefs, I'm a coral reef biologist by, by trade, but I also look at how people interact with those reefs and how they use fisheries specifically and how we can work to manage those three portions. And it's part of a puzzle. How can we ensure that the resources are protected? Obviously, we want to ensure that they're protected for these future generations. And from a, a biological or ecological perspective, we want to ensure that we maintain biodiversity but from the human perspective, how can we support local livelihoods? How can we ensure that people can use these resources responsibly at the same time as being able to protect them? So marine reserves can be part of this solution. And that's why I focus on, on the development of marine protected areas. 
and marine reserves. And I'd just like to define those two terms slightly. A marine protected area is an area of the sea where there are some regulations that control a type of use within that area. So you can't do everything possible. You have specific regulations. Normally that means regulations on fishing, so you might not be able to use a specific gear, you might not be able to go there at certain times of year, and that can be formulated into a marine protect area. Now marine reserve is one step beyond that. It means you can't fish, so there are no take reserves. And within a marine protect area um, regulation framework, we want to identify specific areas which no one touches, them. no one takes anything out of that ecosystem. And that's to form kind of a piggy bank, uh, an insurance policy, if you will, that can help protect the rest of that system, it exceeds other areas. But identifying where to put those reserves, and in fact where to manage in general, is the puzzle I want to explore with you this evening. How can we do that? And I'm going to lead you through a few of the different components that we do. And the first one is, is kind of obvious. What do we have? We need to define the essential habitat. Where are we going to focus our attention? Now, this is a, an area of Honduras, and you can go out on the boat, and you can drive around, and you can look at the beautiful sea, and you can see it looks wonderful. It looks pristine. And pristine is a word that we hear a lot, especially in tourism magazines. It's a pristine reef. It's a pristine coastal system. Now, from above the water, that may well be true, it looks pristine, but it's very hard just by driving around the area to identify what's actually under the water. But it's very expensive to dive around across a very large area of sea to identify where is the best area. So, how can we find these important areas beneath the waves? So, the first step in marine spatial planning is to use satellite imagery. And there's lots of satellites flying over us right now. And even from a very coarse image such as this, we can identify just through colour differences where the reefs are. And I've written them in red, and I do apologise for red to colour blind people. I took this out of a different slide and I couldn't change the colours of it. So I'll just put that disclaimer in. But there's all, they're also numbered, so you can see one, two, three, four, five. Those are reef systems. Doesn't really tell us very much, but it's narrowed our field of, of view, it's narrowed our focus. So we can then get better resolution imagery, and this is uh, high resolution satellite imagery. It's actually so high resolution that we can zoom right in on specific keys if we're particularly interested. The white log you can see to the right, that's actually a fishing boat, it's a shrimp trawler. So you can get very, very high definition imagery. And just from that, you can identify, and you, you yourselves can see where are the reef shapes, those are the dark masses to the, to the right of this image. But you can get additional information, such as the current patterns, you can see the wave exposure of different areas. And so you can compile this information into habitat maps. And you can identify by running different algorithms on this, this image, just based on the colors within that image, where we think different corals would be, where we think seagrass would be, and then we get a better idea of what we can do. So we go to that area, and we can then fly around, this is actually taken from a kite. So we know where we're interested in, and we can go out to the field, and we can send up a camera under a kite, and again, take higher resolution imagery. So we haven't even got into the water, and we have a fairly good idea of what's going to be there when we do. So when we actually do, we know we're going to be looking at something that we're interested in. So then we can send out teams of biologists to look at how the coral cover is, they run transects, work out the coral cover, look at fish, uh, fish diversity, fish abundance, and compile all of that information. But we're really concentrating our effort. So we've gone through several steps just to get into the water. And at the end of it, you produce these pretty colored pictures. And this is a habitat map for, for a part of Honduras. And all it is, is basically different areas that we're interested in. And we can layer and layer and layer different amounts of information into this system so that we can then start making informed decisions. But that's just the beginning of spatial planning. Because we can understand what resources we have, the static ones, in general. We can understand where the reefs are, where the seagrass are, where our primary habitats are, the building blocks. 
But we also need to be able to look at where the fish are. And unfortunately, <coughs> fish move. May seem obvious, but actually it's a real conundrum because they don't just move by swimming, as, it, as, as shoals or schools swimming around in the sea. They do that, and we need to take that into consideration, how they move and how big their, their ranges are, and that might be from a, a tuna that swims 200 miles to a little damselfish that only moves a few centimeters in its life and has a very small home range. And actually, biologically, we understand the movements of fish quite well. They've been tracked and tagged for a long time. But unfortunately, fish move in other ways as well. They undergo migrations. They undergo some sort of ontogenetic migration, which means they change habitat use in different phases of their life. And that's a lot more complicated. Because here we have little yellowtail snappers swimming around in their, their nursery area. That's a mangrove. And they use the mangrove seagrass area. And as they're using it as juveniles, they're eating and they're growing, and they grow some more. And after about two years, they're now sufficiently big enough that they have to move out onto the reef. So here he comes onto the reef, and he turns into that fish. And the reason I'm focusing on the yellowtail snapper is it's actually a very, very important commercial species. We eat it here a lot in Florida, but a lot of that yellowtail snapper is actually coming from the Western Caribbean, from places like Honduras. Now, that migration from seagrass areas out onto reefs might happen over hundreds of meters, but it might happen over kilometers or tens of kilometers or even potentially hundreds of kilometers. So that's a much more complex puzzle. How do we track a fish that's recruiting out of the plankton so it's been floating in, in the sea and it recruits into a seagrass bed in one area and as it grows it then migrates and moves to a completely different area of reef? How can we incorporate that kind of movement? And in fact, how can we define it? Now, here's the, the wizardry behind some of this, the, the science that I wanted to, to get to. We can actually use chemical signatures in the fish and in the ear stones. Now, within the, the head of a fish, there's very small little stone structures that are made of calcium carbonate, and it's part of the, the balance and sensory system of the fish. Kind of like our ear bone, but they have stones. Now, as this is not the schedule, but they're very, very small. <laughs> now, as the fish grows, it's absorbing the calcium carbonate into its um, body, and that's going into the stone. But at the same time, it's also absorbing trace elements. Instead of the calcium, the 2 plus ions, it's taking strontium, the SR2 plus, or manganese, or other metal ions in trace amounts. And it's getting that from the environment. So depending what the concentrations are in the environment in which the fish is living, it will absorb a similar ratio of those um, ions into its ear stone. Okay, so we have a chemical signature based on where the fish was. So if we cut through that ear stone, we can actually get a history of the fish, a chemical history of the fish, kind of like um, the rings on a tree trunk. <coughs> okay, if you cut down a tree, you can count the rings because the tree is growing and laying down layers. Well, the opalith, these ear stones, grow in the same way. So year on year, they're getting bigger. So we cut through them, and the, the core of that ear stone has the signature of where that fish was as a juvenile. And the outer portion of that ear stone has the signature of where it was as an adult. So if we use some very fancy, I'm going to take laser ablation, um, some, uh, a, a chemical, a, an analytical chemical technique to measure very, very fine concentrations of these chemicals, we can actually track across from the core to the outer rim and measure the concentrations of these trace elements. So we get a chemical history of where that fish has been. Now, that's all fascinating from a, from a laboratory point of view, from an analytical chemist's point of view. But how can we actually use that in the real world? So what we can do is we can go out to habitats, to the juvenile nurseries. We know they're going to be found in the, in the seagrass areas. And we can collect up the juvenile fish. We can take out their ear stones. Unfortunately, the fish doesn't survive. Once take the ear stones out. Um, and then you can define the elemental signature for those, those nursery grounds. And providing that each ground 
has a different chemical composition, we can define those different areas. So then we can go to the adult site, the fishing bank, where the fishermen are taking fish off the reef, and we can do the same. We can take the otoliths out of those fish, cut them across, and try and match the core signatures back to those juvenile habitats. And here we display it very nicely as arrows. And what we find is, and this is a, a real example, the top circle um, is on Roatan, and I see grass beds from Roatan, and the fish are actually moving about 35 kilometers to recruit on banks to the southwest. And then the middle yellow circle, that I've also highlighted, that's in Utila, another island, another seagrass bed, and again, the juveniles were moving out to these banks. But what we find is the two other sites that we also had juveniles from, we couldn't find their signatures in these adult fishing banks. So we could be fairly certain within the fish that we sampled, they weren't coming from those areas. So already, just using that technique, we can identify two areas as being priority sites for this fishery, and two areas that aren't as important. Now we can also do this genetically, and we use genetic techniques. Um, I'm gonna say it's similar to, to the other technique. You can use um, genetic markers within the, within the DNA to identify adults, and you can link that back to juveniles, and you can match up the genetic material in juveniles well. And we can actually track the adults back to where the juveniles were. So again, using that same technique across the same seascape, we can identify a priority area, an adult area, which is seeding all of those juvenile areas. So just using those two techniques, we can differentiate where we want to, like, where we want to prioritize management, where we want to prioritize protection. Now, the puzzle gets a little bit more complicated in that fish move over great distances. So we get quite a lot of mixing. So that square was the, the, the previous slide, and this is now the major American root system. And what we actually find when we expand this work is we're getting fish coming down from the leaves, and from Key Corker down to one of these banks, we have a 92% probability that the fish on this bank are actually coming from the leaves. And then coming from the east, they're moving, that's 300 miles, and they're coming in, and we have a 58% probability that they're coming in from that source. So we can actually use this to, to scale up our management units, and it provides a, a very nice way of connecting up different habitats in space and time. And we're actually doing this at the moment, not just on yellowtail snapper, we're also doing it on conch and lobster, because they're commercially important, and people love to eat them. Uh, we're also doing it on parrotfish, and hopefully you don't love to eat parrotfish. We like to protect parrotfish because they're ecologically very, very important to, to maintain reefs. But we can actually do this on a whole range of different species. And by doing it on all these different species, you can overlay all these different connectivity patterns and really start to work out where we want to protect. Now, so we understand how the fish utilize the sea sea. We know how they're moving across it. We've been tracking them chemically, and we've been tracking them genetically. But we also have to be able to track the fishes. Because fish move, but unfortunately, fishermen move as well. And they actually move a lot more. And they're, how can their current and future activities influence reserve placement? Now this is a really crucial kind of interface between biological science and social economic science or social science. Because we need to understand human behavior and its impact on biological systems. But we can actually approach it, and as a biologist, I like to approach it biologically. So I kind of view fishermen as, as one of the fish that I study. So I try to study their movements and map their movements, map their predatory effects, and, and use them as part of my ecosystem model. So where are all the fishermen? Now this is actually quite a simple thing to do. You could go to different communities, and you could ask uh, how many fishermen there are in each area, and you can find out how they're fishing, and you can find out what boats they're using, and you can build a, a map like this. You can The red dots are proportional to the number of fishermen there are in each area. And if they're artisanal fishermen, and artisanal fishermen isn't someone who builds his own fishing net or builds his own boat, it's someone who uses smaller boats or simpler gears, as opposed to industrial fishing, which tends to be on a much bigger scale. So with our seasonal fishing communities, we're fairly confident that they're going to be using small boats, so they're within a limited range of shore. 
we're fairly confident they're going to be using specific targeted gear types, such as a spear or hooks and lines. So we can directly correlate the number of fishermen that we find in an area to the local impact of that fishery. So that's a fairly simple, straightforward relationship. And we can map that, and we can incorporate that into a design. And better yet, we can actually talk to them. And we can find out where their priority sites are. Where are the spawning aggregation sites they have? Where are their um, migration routes that they know about? Where are the areas that they're interested in protecting? Because if we can get the, the fishermen on site identifying these things and participating in management and in the design of, re of reserves, combining that with the biological and the ecological data, we actually have a much stronger way of protecting these systems, especially in countries with very weak governments such as Hungary. Now, there's a second part. There's about 1,500 artisanal fishermen in Honduras on the North Shore. There's about 3,500 industrial fishermen. Now, the industrial fishermen work on big boats, and they go far offshore. So, you could go to the communities, and this again, this is in rural eastern Honduras amongst the uh, Mosquito Indian population there. They they're all working in the industrial fishery. We've worked out where, which communities they're in. And we did this as part of a census to see the economic impact of that fishery, how important it was to, to rural livelihood. $7.2 million, if, you, if you're interested. But that doesn't actually help us, because they're not fishing where the community is. So there's no local direct impact. They're actually going out on these rather large boats. And there's 80 guys crammed onto that boat. And they all dive off into the water to pick up lobster and con, spearfish, and, uh, and put themselves in mortal danger at the same time. This actually, this is the last week that this fishery will be running. This is a little bit of an aside for you. Um, the, the industrial lobster fishery uh, using scuba gear is ending at the end of February, which is great, because it currently injures about 150 people a year who get diving accidents, and about 20 of them then die from that diving action. And part of that same census that brought up the number of fishermen we have, we actually had the very sad poll that a thousand people across that community, or across those communities, are now paralyzed from working in that fishery. So that's another part that the social side of the, the work that uh, marine management brings with it. So these guys, they're diving down, they're collecting the lobster, um, and they're going across the seascape. So I'm going to bring you back to this map, bring you back to, to Honduras. We're very, very lucky in Honduras that with, on those big boats, there's actually satellite trackers. There's GPS systems sending up real-time information of where every boat in the industrial fleet is. Now, that's a great data source. I'm surprised more countries don't have it if a, a very poor developing country can run that system. So this is a, a track, a real track, of one of those boats going out on one of its trips, and it's leaving from, from an island of Guanaja, and it's sailing off 300 miles to the east, and it's poofing around looking for lobster, and it's backtracking and picking up some people and going back out. So that's one track of one boat. That's the second track of another boat. That's the third track of a third boat. And very soon, we're going to drown in data. There's actually 300 boats in the industrial fishery split between lobster, con, finfish, and shrimp. But if you layer all that data together, you're going to end up with spaghetti. So how do we unravel these spaghetti trails? How can we use that information, and it's a very important data set, how can we use that to understand where people are going, how they're fishing, and the fishing intensity on different areas? Now what we can do is actually disaggregate the movement. We can filter it, and we use very clever algorithms that, that take all of that, that GPS data, all that position data, which also logs its speed, and we can actually separate out the, the activities of the boat by the speed. So this is actually the shrimp trawling fishery, and we know if it's moving at a certain speed, so above three knots, it's not going to be trawling, it's moving too fast. So that's all the trawling, that's all the, the moving data, so we can actually get rid of it. It's irrelevant for our purposes. If it's resting, so it's not moving at all, we can also get rid of it. Because, again, it's not truly. You need to be moving at about two to three knots to be 
dragging a, a shrimp trawl. So we get down, and we've got rid of all the spaghetti, and we're down to a heat map of what we're interested in. And we can actually then focus in on the area. The, the green line is a, a protected area that I'll get to in a minute. Um, and the colors are how much time these boats, and this is all of the boats in the lobster fleet, uh, in, the, in the shrimp fleet, are fishing in a given area. And now that is actually very useful information, because we can now see that there is a conflict between the use of the shrimp boat and the proposed exclusive use area, the, the protected area that we're trying to put in. So we can now work on this data with the shrimp industry and say, okay, if we move the borders this amount, that will now decrease the impact on your fishery. And it, it opens the negotiation table. So this is how science can then lead into supporting other groups to take it forward and negotiate the boundaries of protected areas. So we can have local knowledge. We can identify priority sites. We can mitigate spatial conflicts because we can compile all this information into one place. So we're building on the habitat map to define where different areas are. We're then working out how fish move across the seascape. We then work out how the fishermen move across that same seascape. And we end up with a very good idea of where we need to protect. Where do we want to put our protected areas in general? And how can we identify priority sites for no paper zones? So putting it into practice, how can we make fishermen smile? How can we actually use this as a tool to sustain life? I'm going to show you a very brief video. And this is actually a proposal that's in progress at the moment. We worked on defining the spatial limits of this protected area. Now, it includes over 750 square kilometers of coral reef, and seagrass beds, and mangrove forests. It includes 54 keys of more or less or previously uncharted areas. And we're working with the local communities to develop sustainable fishing practices so we know what's a good way of fishing and what's a very bad way of fishing. We've identified where nursery grounds are and we've worked out where the spawning aggregation sites are. And what's really impressive is, and this is where it links back into the closure of the industrial fishery, this area would now be managed by the artisanal fishing. So it's being taken out of the hands of the dive fishery, the industrial fishery, and being put into the hands of the local indigenous communities to use that area. Now, to give you some perspective of how big that area is, it's actually the size of connected. So it's quite big. It'll be the largest protected area in Central America, and the third largest in the Caribbean. And where all of the no-take zones are, are put in place across that, It'll actually cover 300,000 hectares, making it the largest network of no-take areas in the Caribbean. Now, why is that quite so kind of monumental? This has taken a year from start to finish to get from the idea all the way through the process to get it up to the point where a government could then decide whether to do that or not. Now, that is very, very fast, because if you could use these tools correctly, you can actually generate the kind of information you need very, very rapidly. And now this is very important because within Honduras, what we're trying to do is establish where to put no-take reserves across 20% of the fishable area of the entire country, which would be the first country in the Western Hemisphere to do that. Now, why do you need to do that? Well, you need to be able to protect critical habitat from exploitation. And what's, from my point of view, very interesting about it is we have the tools, we have the techniques to be able to do that, especially in, in developed nations, especially here, and one of the great things of me being with the Smithsonian is I have all of these tools at my fingertips. And we can bring those and really use them and apply them in very unique ways. So, I love that. 
the really crucial thing, and, and how to bring this back into the room after a brief journey out down to Honduras, is why is it important that this, this fisherman is so happy? Well, um, there's lots of reasons from, from his point of view, but from our side, uh, as, as consumers of seafood, we want to, to continue to be able to eat lobster and conch. And I don't know if any of you know that uh, there is no conch caught within the US. All the conch that is consumed is all imported. Now, we're also working to look at how to manage conch fisheries. Now, with the lobster, all, most of the lobster that's in red lobster, when imported by garden, actually comes from Honduras. It's not caught by Mr. Happy here, but because um, they actually they, they have a buying policy that will only um, buy from, from the trap fishery. But if this fisherman can help develop a sustainable fishery, there's a very, very strong market here in the States to buy the products that he can catch, which can really provide the incentive to change, the incentive to then protect these, these no take areas the incentive to get involved in management. Because what is very, very common is we can go into an area and say, oh, well, we can't fish in this area, and we're going to take away 20% of your fishing grounds. And what that normally means is we're going to take 20% of your profit away. Because you're only going to be left with 80% of the fishing. Yeah? And if someone came to me and said, we're going to take away 20% of your income, I'd be quite upset. Yeah? So what's very, very interesting here, and this is how the science is really helping, is we can provide the information where people can actually make very, very good informed decisions and design reserves that actually work. At the same time, there's local NGOs that work with Mr. Happy here to make sure that he can actually develop the sustainable fisheries. So there's a very, very strong partnership between the work from the Smithsonian and local Honduran counterparts. And it's, it's a very new approach to marine management. It's very new to be able to develop these tools and use them so fast and actually have a country that really wants to use that information. And it's a little sad that we look at other places and there'll be maybe 1% or 2% as a no-take reserve. And really the take-home message, and this isn't a, you know, a eulogy, the take-home message is we do need to protect a very significant portion of our marine systems from exploitation to ensure that we can use them and exploit them in other areas. And on that, I'm going to say thank you very much. And I left some time for questions because I, I'm I like to interact with the audience, and I, I wanted to throw out some ideas, throw out some techniques, and if you have any specific questions about this program or about <coughs> how we do some of this work, I'm more than happy to uh, answer your, your inquiries. Once you've established a marine reserve, and you acknowledge these are some of the poorest countries in the world, how do you possibly expect to enforce it? Yeah. That is a great question. Um, and one we can Now, in, there, there's two types of reserves that we're setting up. One are locally based marine reserves where a local community is establishing where it wants to protect. Um, and we're working to help refine where those areas are. So they're biologically sensible, they're ecologically sensible. Now, the government is working to grant fishers rights, exclusive use rights. So there's a direct benefit where if they protect the area, they will receive a better fishery in return. Now, we're also, um, or that the NGO in, in Honduras is working to um, improve marine enforcement through the Navy, is working on education programs with them, but from a, a larger scale from the industrial fisheries, we actually already have the tool to stop industrial fishing within that large protected area and some tracking data. Because we know where these boats are in real time and we can tell by their movements whether they're fishing or not. So if they end the area, that's fine. 
the satellite will tell you they're there. But if they actually change their behavior so they're deploying fishing gear, the satellite will also tell us that. So as soon as they enter, it, it sends up an alert. And we're actually writing that system now. Um, as soon as their behavior changes, it'll log that that boat was um, uh, doing a, a fishing infraction. And the actual other boats will then find it. So the association of fishermen will find it. So it's actually getting user groups to lead the way in, in marine conservation. We provide the science so they can actually make good decisions. And I'm a firm believer if we actually have the information, we can make good decisions. And we've seen that in actionable change that, that's happened at very large scales. So I don't think it has to be a top-down approach. I don't think we need the government, and we know the government is very weak, um, to be able to, to provide the kind of level of legislation and enforcement. The actual communities and officials themselves are, are probably the best guardians of the group. <laughs> so where do you get your authority? We don't set them up. We provide the, the science so that other people can then set them up. So we, we can make recommendations to say these would be very good areas biologically, ecologically, social, economically. And then the, the NGO, actually the, the fisher groups themselves, take that forward to set them up. So, um, and it's, it's a very interesting partnership between, between science and, and the NGO uh, within Honduras in that they've got very, very close connections with the communities. And it's actually the community groups that take it forward. And, and the, the work in, in the Mosquito is actually, I'm supporting the NGO and providing the science so they can make decisions. They're supporting 16 indigenous groups that as a commission have taken the proposal, they wrote the proposal and took it forward to the government. And that's actually being decided next week. But, uh, so we don't get involved in policy. We don't get involved in actually delimiting the reserves, but we do provide the information so that we can do that. What kind of interaction would you expect between a local official and a versus those that are going to be in the industrial or a lot of conflict area? It's actually, that's, it's been very interesting. Uh, over the last year, we've been doing a lot of um, social economic surveys and household surveys across the entire coastal zone. And we found a lot of um, interchange, actually. So an artisanal fisher would also work with the industrial fisher. And what happens is they return to the artisanal fisheries when the industrial fisheries are closed, or when um, they can't find other employment. So the industrial fishery provides the cash, the cash economy, whereas the artisanal fishing is your, your economic safety net. It's providing um, your, your social security, your economic buffer. When times are hard, you can always go out and fish your, your local group. So there's, there's act, it actually makes it very complicated as people can't put in regulations on industrial fishing. For example, closing this, uh, this dive fishery, which is socially very, very good decision to make, what they're doing is pushing 3,500 people into our fishing. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of exchange between them. It's, it's a very important aspect of the world. In these areas, when you talk about the sustainability, are you actually, are you seeing an increase in the state rates of the fish population or the size of the fish uh, by having these areas you know, uh, of reserves? What, what kind of results are you getting? Them? Well, with, with the reserve out in Mosquito, that's just being established at the moment. Now, we're setting up mechanisms to monitor that. We're actually looking to use genetic techniques to monitor the the overflow or the, the connectivity between the reserve areas, the no-take areas, and the wider marine system and fish areas, and also measure the impact genetically of the fishing pressure on the, the population as a whole. So we should actually be able to measure it, and we'll actually be able to measure it at a lot finer spatial resolution, and also a lot faster than we'll normally be able to do that. But to give you an example, um, in an area I've been working for quite a long time, which is the Utila, the island of Utila, We've got fishing data from 10 years ago, and we've finished analyzing that, comparing it to today, and the actual fish populations and uh, uh, the landing ratios of different species haven't changed in 10 years. So the way that fishery has, has been managed is actually sustaining the, the, the local fish population. So there is good news, and that's, that's actually one of the take-homes. 
there is good news. Everyone talks doom and gloom about reef science, which, and there's a lot of reasons to, to, be, to be worried. There's a lot of threats and impacts on reefs. But there are things that can be done, actionable change at a local level, which if you connect together can make national or even regional change. And if we can really put science in the hands of local users, they can make change. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive to see. That's where the, that's where the puzzle gets bigger, um, and, and this is one of the. It's kind of like opening Pandora's box. You, you you focus. I used to focus on one community. I was working with a one specific fishing community, and we thought we knew everything about how they fish and where they fish and when they fish and everything about them. And we could come up with with specific plans with them, and then we started working out that actually the fish were coming in from much further away. And, that's where I expanded the work to, to be the far north shore, and then expanded out to the Mosquitia. And now we've started to work up in Belize, um, and we'll probably move and start working out in Nicaragua and out in Colombia as well. And this is where we've really got to start focusing on, on what are our priorities, what we actually want to, to achieve from marine management. In Belize, Belize is, is, a, is a regional leader in marine conservation. Um, Honduras has always been kind of the... Uh, uh, what's a polite way of saying? Um, <laughs> they've always been the uh, the example of, of bad. Honduras has very, very bad international <laughs> press for a lot of reasons, and, and marine governance and conservation hasn't been very good. That is now changing. Uh, uh, this is another aside. Uh, next week, Honduras is leading a proposal to put hammerhead sharks on uh, appendix to a site. So it may actually, and it's already a shark sanctuary, so protect sharks at the whole ocean. Um, it's now leading global change in, in shark conservation. So we're trying to turn the, uh, the black swan into the, uh, into the white swan, into the ugly duck <laughs> into, the, into the swan. Is there, um, in your studies of trying to determine the size of these reserves, do you see, like, if there's a minimal size that, or, or, that you can go before you get an internal ecological collapse? And is it different between the invertebrates and the vertebrates? That is the eternal question of paleontologists. <coughs> Do we go for lots of small ones or one big one and where we put it? Um, I'm not going to put myself out and answer that. <laughs> um, what, I, what I can say is you want to get them as big as you can. And it's there, there's a certain kind of very basic rules of, of where to put them. You need to protect your spawning stocks. You need to protect your migration routes. Those are the obvious ones. Your, your, your low-hanging fruit. Beyond that, you're then starting to get into um, spatial modelling. We're looking at current patterns. We're looking at larval dispersal. We're looking at larval retention. And we're hoping that a lot of the genetic techniques that we're, we're using will actually help answer that. And we're at a very, very interesting phase. And again, working in a country that's never really had marine protection before, we can put the reserves in and actually measure directly how they work. And normally, that's not the case. Reserves have been in place under different levels of management and protection, and then scientists have come in and gone, oh, well, actually, that's in the wrong place. Or, oh, actually, we need to move that. Or, oh, we, well, we don't really know what it was like before. So it's actually providing an amazing opportunity to designing things right from the start, and then use continually monitor the site, uh, monitor these areas, and we're being very honest. We're saying this is as good as we can design at the moment, and we'll come back to you iteratively and say, ah, oh, we've now found that if we shift this this way, we'll have this kind of benefit, or we need to expand the areas to protect this kind of, of, uh, of population. So especially using genetic techniques and molecular techniques, those are actually very, very hard things to do. Um, and in, when I was explaining about doing the mapping at the beginning, that's pretty labor-intensive. Once you're in the water counting fish, that's very labor-intensive. But collecting genetic samples, you can collect hundreds of genetic samples very, very quickly. And actually, we're training fishermen, for the lobster fishery, to be collecting those samples as part of what they do. So they will help collect the, the, 
the samples that we need to be able to help them manage their fisheries. So it's, it's a public part. I didn't ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> Two parts. Um, within the Honduran situation, is there any provision for uh, bringing lionfish to market? And mm -hmm. part two would be once these no take zones are established, will there be any provision uh, to remove lionfish only from those areas? I'm glad you brought up lionfish. Yes. Um, yes, and no. I don't know. Happy to answer me. Yes. Um, Lionfish is a problem in, in Honduras. Uh, I've actually been studying their invasion across the country uh, since they were first spotted. And it was the organisation I used to work with that first logged their, their entry point. Um, we've actually been working with uh, Garifuna communities. If I pull up one of these slides, um, we were working with Garifuna communities to train them to stop shooting parent fish, which we like. And if you notice on the end of his spear, yeah, you got a pulse raise back here with that fly. We started salivating. There you go. Perfect. Well, this is this is on Ruratan. This is the east end of Ruratan. These are Garifuna um, fishers. They were shooting <coughs> parent fish, as you can see on that shot. There aren't very many fish there. Um, we and they had a lot of lionfish. We trained them to shoot lionfish. Um, handle them correctly and then sell them to the tourist market at the other end of the island. So that's where all the cruise ships are and all the restaurants are. There you go. It is, um, it is one of the things that we, we are interested in working on. The problem is, they were actually part of the fishing. They nailed all their line fish in about six months. Um, so I think we could actually export the Griffin and fishes to other areas that we need to just control line fish. Uh, they were incredibly effective. Um, and now what they've done, and it's one of the issues I have with, with I'm going to go off topic here, but lionfish fisheries, it's kind of an oxymoron, because the object of a fishery, or fisheries management, is to make it sustainable so you always have the resource. The object of lionfish exter extermination is to get rid of them. So you're either going to fail from your fisheries management point of view, or you're going to fail from your lionfish control point of view. But either way, you kind of... Not, not going to win. So I, I'm not really sure what the solution is for live fish. These guys were very, very effective. There's now very few live fish anywhere near them. We're trying to uh, <laughs> get them to go out to other communities and teach them how to do it. Um, do I think it would be economically viable to export lion fish from Honduras to the US? No. Uh, people have looked into it. Darden's looked into it, for example. So Red Wolf's uh, looking into it. Um, it's not consistent enough. There actually aren't enough of them. And this is my other single line fish. There's lots of them, but there's nowhere near as many as there are yellowtail snapper or, or the commercial fisheries that we see. You know, you don't jump into a shoal of 5,000 um, 5, line fish. You can jump into a shoal of 5,000 yellowtail snapper. You wouldn't want to jump into a shoal of 5,000 line fish. But, um, so the jury's still out about what we're going to do now. But we do shoot them. And, and I don't know. How big is your staff and how many scientists did you have in Honduras when you were there? When I was there, um, I actually founded the NGO um, in 2006, uh, and it was me. Um, <laughs> and then um, collected people to work with me. There's now nine people working through the, through the organization. Uh, they're, all now, they're all national scientists. And here, within the Smithsonian, it's just me at the moment working on this. But I, my now class is putting together postdoctoral researchers and, and other researchers that will then provide academic support to, to them. And, and again, lift, lift national capacity up to the next level. So it's growing. It's now a very important hub for marine science in, in the country and actually in, in Central America. Um, so it is, it is possible to change marine management in, in complicated countries. Well, uh, I would like to ask you to uh, uh, join us in the back. We have a little reception, and please.
please. Um, we have some evaluation forms. Laura is standing in the back waving them at me, <laughs> to remind me to tell you that we have evaluation forms in the back for, for COSI, and we would really appreciate it if you take uh, just a minute and fill those in. There's some pencils back there as well. But uh, please uh, stick around and talk to Steve some more, ask him some more questions, and enjoy a little uh, reception in the back. And thank you again for coming.